You have the right to remain silent. If you choose to give up this right, everything you say can and will be used against you. All right. <clears throat> Morning. We heard from uh, Dr. Burnett the latest in the effort to drag organized behavioral science kicking and screaming into the 21st century and recognize what's been in front of their faces for uh, hundreds of years, and that is the efforts of one parent to cut the children off from another parent. As parental alienation, as a concept, as a syndrome, as a disorder, has been developing in the scientific literature, there was a very interesting moment. In the, in the progress of science, science doesn't get ahead by agreement among folks. Uh, those of us who are scientists know that science gets ahead by kicking, screaming, pounding on the table, arguing, and fighting for grant money. <laughs> One of the best best ways for science to progress is through active debate in the literature of science. In the 1980s, a very influential and important specialized journal, um, Issues in uh, sex Child Sexual Abuse, uh, published and uh, edited by Ralph Underwager and Halita Wakefield, uh, chronicled uh, much of the disasters from the McMartin case forward. And there was a very active debate that was uh, carried on in the literature of science between Richard Gardner and our next speaker. And uh, I'm, uh, I, I, I think of the Monitor and the Merrimack in the war between the states, <laughs> lobbing shells <laughs> at each other through the debate of science because Richard Gardner would write about parental alienation and how he felt it needed to be seen and diagnosed, and this and our next speaker would lob uh, empirical uh, epithets, screaming and hollering about reliability, validity, test retest, iterator reliability, and uh, construct validity, ecological validity, etc. Gardner would shoot back lots of stories about actual children in actual families in actual cases, whereupon our next speaker would lob stuff back at him about the literature of science and the development of epistemological proofs, etc. I felt, well, let's see, since they're friends of mine, and I also happen to know from the work I did in, my, in a PhD on, in philosophy, a fellow named Robin Dawes, who was the chairman of the Department of Decisional Sciences, at Carnegie Mellon University, and Robin Dawes won the Mann Award for, uh, from the American Psychological Association for his book on rational thinking. Well, I, I figured, well, this will be fun. Let's invite them to dinner. So I brought Robin Dawes to dinner with Richard Gardner to dinner and his arch rival in this scientific debate, our next speaker, and sat back and watched the fur fly and the scotch flow. Out of that dinner, uh, the agreement of these two scientists uh, about how to speak about parental alienation developed in a new and a different way, and it's, it's had its uh, wonderful blossoming fruit demonstrated in the recent work by Dr. Burnett. I don't think that the intensely scholarly work that Dr. Burnett brought together or that uh, Dr. Sauber and I were able to bring together in the Inter International Handbook uh, would have been as, as robust uh, and as valuable had it not been for the debates in the literature of science between um, our next speaker and uh, Dr. Gardner and that scotch-laden uh, uh, evening. And, and so we are all indebted to the ultimate empiricist, Dr. Terence Campbell.
The truth is, Demos sat us down and said, you two have got to find a common ground. And if you don't, uh, I'm not going to feed either one of you at this dinner. <laughs> You'll go hungry. Welcome. Welcome to New York on a quiet, tranquil Sunday morning. And we know that New York is not always quiet and tranquil. This is a city where at the start of the New York Marathon, the starting gun can sometimes draw return fire. <laughs> and, 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 and speaking of the, of the New York Marathon, they'll, they'll be running it soon, in and, 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 and about a month. And, 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 and the New York Marathon is unique. It is, it, it is unique. Um, the runners start at the Verrazano Bridge, wind their way through Staten Island, then Brooklyn, Queens, the Bronx, before finishing in Central Park. Coincidentally, this is the same route that many cab drivers take when they bring you in from Newark. <laughs> now, and speaking of cabs, you see, uh, New Yorkers have a reputation for being um, aggressive and, and outspoken, but I saw a, a, a compelling example of, of New Yorkers cooperating just, just the other day. Um, they were sharing a cab. One guy took the tires and the radio, and another guy <laughs> took the engine, and, and, and they, had, they had a good division of labor. Um, approximately one year ago, Newsweek published an article asking, does clinical psychology rely on scientific evidence? And the verdict of that article was an emphatic no. Psychologists are deeply ambivalent about the role of science, lacking solid science training. Psychologists admit they value personal experience over research evidence. So often, psychologists will make clinical decisions based on what we jokingly call water cooler consultations. That is, you happen to be at the water cooler in the office, another colleague by chance shows up, you ask that colleague a question about a difficult patient, and you consider your colleague's answer to be well-informed, which is a blind article of faith. A 2008 survey of 591 psychologists in private practice demonstrated that they rely more on their own experience, their own intuitive, subjective, unverified experience than relying on scientific data when making decisions about patients. Now, I should also point out that this morning I will refer frequently to psychologists because this is the literature with which I am most familiar by virtue of my status as a psychologist. However, I would also point out my comments are equally applicable to psychiatrists, social workers, licensed professional counselors, and marriage and family therapists. Now, Clinical psychology in particular and mental health professions in general operate on the basis of a credential-based practice. That is to say, I have a degree, therefore I can do it. I am a competent person because I have the letters MA, MSW, PhD, uh, or whatever, after my name, and therefore, I can make decisions about the welfare of my clients. 
So we're assuming that credentials equal competence. And having made that assumption, practitioners in this model have almost complete autonomy. And this is probably the most important thing I'm going to say today. Practitioners utilizing the credentials model enjoy almost complete autonomy as they regularly conceal their work behind closed doors. It is the nature of the business. Therefore, I can think back over the course of my almost 40 year career of friends and family and neighbors asking me about uh, one mental health professional or another, is this a good therapist? Uh, and I would know that person. I might know that person as, as a professional acquaintance, uh, as a professional partner working in the same clinic, or as just a professional peer. But I also knew that rarely did I know what that person was doing behind closed doors as a therapist. Indeed, there's a world of difference between what mental health professionals say they do and what they actually do. And it is only recently that videotape technology has become a standard operating method for the training of mental health professionals, and it is still too rare. Consequently, so much of what we know about what therapists do is based on secondhand and thirdhand accounts. Now, in the procedure-based model, which we find in medicine, here we see a situation where the emphasis is on learning and demonstrating what to do. For example, a procedure-based model for mental health professionals might emphasize the acquisition of specific skills such as uh, specific skills for treating families of divorce and training for this outcome, treating families of divorce, reducing the frequency and intensity, and intensity of parental conflicts, increasing the capacity of parents to cooperate and communicate effectively are the desired outcomes. And then you have videotape technology to see. This is the first session. This is the fifth or sixth session. Are we making progress? This plain and simple approach, unfortunately, is characterized by its conspicuous absence in the mental health professions. In fact, considerable evidence indicates that many, if not most, clinicians view science or research as having little relevance to their practice activities and so forth. In many respects, the mental health professions in general and psychology in particular are still functioning as if it were 1948. There has not been substantial progress made since that time. So are we progressing? Yes, at a snail's pace. Now, Why are we progressing at a snail's pace? Because this is what we've been doing ever since Harry Truman. Like physicians in an earlier time, 
clinical psychologists and other mental health professionals have assumed responsibilities that outstripped their basic competence and abilities. After World War II, we were inundated by all kinds of problems presented by combat-exposed veterans, and the mental health profession said, oh yes, we can respond to those problems. When no, they couldn't. So now, let's just stop for a moment and ask the obvious question. What is the relevance of these issues that I'm discussing to parental alienation? And the relevance is this. The mental health professional who did your child custody evaluation or is undertaking treatment with one or more of your children or is seeing you and your divorced spouse together to try to reduce the intensity and frequency of your conflicts, in those circumstances, at best, the chances are the professional that you're dealing with is competent. Chances are only 50-50. You're flipping a coin. So then... The question becomes one of, how do we identify competent professionals? How do we identify competent psychologists? Well, if we consider the peer-reviewed literature, Nadine Caslow and her colleagues in a 2007 peer-reviewed article published in Professional Psychology, tells us when psychologists ask themselves specifically what is competence, the answer is not readily forthcoming. Psychology is a profession, needs improvement in assessing knowledge, skills, attitudes, capabilities, and suitability for the profession and in self-assessment. Uh, wonderful. In other words, we don't know how to assess competence of mental health professionals. Leah, in a 2007 article in Professional Psychology, says psychology has entered the area of accountability <coughs> Excuse me. The overt demonstration of competence is expected, but expected as it is, it's not happening. Instead, we are working on developing the assessment process for competence. Indeed, psychology and all of the other mental health professions are fledging professions when it comes to the assessment of professional competence. The profession has not kept pace with other healthcare professions in terms of continuing education. I have embarrassing first-hand experience with those kinds of problems. I am licensed to practice psychology in the state of Michigan. I reside in the state of Michigan. And I can tell you, for psychologists, the state of Michigan has no continuing education requirement. None. Nada. The prevailing attitude amongst practicing psychologists in the state of Michigan is we don't need no pointy head intellectuals coming from those ivory towers telling us what to do. Relying on our clinical judgment, based on our accumulated clinical experience, we are doing just fine until we encounter a situation where Dr. Demosthenes Lorandos cross-examines one of us and then we run for the hills. 
So we are working on developing that assessment process and working on it because <coughs> psychology has had problems defining its competencies in terms precise enough to be measurable. The field until recently has evidence disarray in identification of the competencies ubiquitous to professional practice. Therefore, when it comes to identifying and assessing the competence of psychologists and other mental health professionals, the bottom line is we don't quite know what we're doing yet. So, additionally, when we think of mental health professionals and identifying competence, then we consider issues of, well, what theory? I mean, we've got, we've got Freudians, neo-Freudians, humanists, client-centered therapists, behavior therapists, cognitive behavioral therapists, family systems therapists, and <coughs> God only knows who else. And each theoretical orientation can claim only we can define competence within our theoretical sphere and other professionals outside our theoretical sphere have no business defining competence for us. Therefore, if we prefer to claim that competence is exhibited by authentic human beings relating to each other in an existentially grounded manner, we can make that claim. Oh, okay. So, having completed their degrees, what should we expect from mental health professionals in general, psychology in particular? Well, again, we don't know. The field lacks well-defined benchmarks for progressing from undergraduate school to graduate school through internship training postdoctoral training to fully independent uh, practicing. We really don't know what is the appropriate route to take through that, through that process. Um, Mental health professionals in general, and psychologists in particular, are rarely board certified. Uh, there are certification groups such as the American Board of Professional Psychology. Uh, and truth in advertising necessitates that uh, I disclose I am board certified in forensic psychology by the American Board of Professional Psychology. And I have to honestly tell you, does that guarantee competence? No. It just decreases the likelihood of encountering a grossly incompetent professional. So, What's going to happen? Where, where are we going? So if we look at other uh, accumulated literature, the position is you'll have to wait until our culture changes. This comes from a peer-reviewed article, again, written by Caslow and her colleagues in professional psychology, saying the culture is gradually shifting. Well, a gradually shifting culture is not going to respond to the needs of people whose children are being ripped apart as a result of divorce and parental alienation. 
And while the culture shifts ever so slowly to considering issues of competence, we still have psychologists relying on, and other mental health professionals relying on, their many, many years of accumulated professional experience. If you ever hear that phrase, relying on my many, many years of accumulated professional experience, my clinical judgment is, at that point, put your hand over your wallet and run as rapidly as you can. Because you're dealing with an ill-informed individual who is resorting to guesswork. Indeed, when we look at the relevant data about what is the relationship between years of accumulated experience and the accuracy of clinical judgment, commentators and peer-reviewed articles are asking, why is the relationship so small? And the relationship between years of accumulated experience and clinical judgment is as small as it is because everybody brings their own biases, their own expectations, and their own subjective impressions to clinical judgment. Now, Spengler and his colleagues in The Counseling Psychologist published in 2009 point out that since 1982, we have known that clinical judgment is suspect. But despite knowing this, for over 25 years, mental health professionals will still take the witness stands in various family courts and express their conclusions based on their clinical judgments. And attorneys and judges will nod their heads knowingly and approvingly. So when relying on clinical judgment, we do not have well-defined procedures for identifying how to gather data, sort data, integrate data, and interpret that data to lead to a logical, rational conclusion. When relying on clinical judgment, we don't know how to do those things. So... Some psychologists, Zimmerman and Hess, in a 2009 issue of Professional Psychology, have said, well, given all of these problems and shortcomings in the field, uh, what we have to do is when doing child custody evaluations in dealing with, 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 with children of divorce, we have to consider basic fundamental ethical issues. Ethical mandate number one, according to Zimmerman and Hess, is the welfare of the children is paramount. Okay. I want to, I just want to stop here for a moment. I want you to assume that you are considering some kind of serious surgery. And in and, 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 and a particular hospital advocates that they do wonderful surgery advertising our surgeons wash their hands. Will that advertisement sway your decision making? Or will you react in terms of, aren't we belaboring the obvious here? And therefore, when we insist, the welfare of the children is paramount. 
were belaboring the obvious, attempting to compensate for the many, many uh, issues about child custody evaluations that are too often overlooked, such as, do you know what Amy Baker is saying about adult children of divorce? Do you know what Glenn Caddy is saying about how alienation is a form of brainwashing? Are you aware of considerations of social support and expressed emotion? And that in circumstances of parental alienation, the levels of expressed emotion, the frequency and the intensity of critical hostile communication soars. The level of social support progressively diminishes and the children suffer accordingly. Are you aware of those concepts? And too often, the average mental health professional is clueless when it comes to those kinds of considerations. But then ethical mandate two, when involved with children of divorce, you should know the law and respond to it. Parents providing therapy also need to think through, if I'm treating this child of divorce, do I need the informed consent of the non-custodial parent? Well, Yes, it's an issue that should be considered. It's also tantamount to claiming our surgeons wash their hands carefully. <laughs> I mean, the issue is obvious, and as obvious as the issue is, it is overlooked again and again and again, where we will have naive, ill-informed therapists appointing themselves to the role of a savior, responding to the plight of the victimized custodial parent who insists that the non-custodian is a villain. And then we have all the ingredients of a compelling soap opera. And as the therapist immerses himself or herself into this compelling soap opera, they don't stop to think, do I even have any business treating this child? Do I have informed consent for treating this child? Ethical mandate three, maintain your independence and objectivity. Uh, that is, be very, very careful if you're making custody, custody recommendations about your own patient who you're treating. So, maintaining independence and objectivity is tantamount to our surgeons wash their hands carefully and deliberately. We've already talked about informed consent. Now, informed consent should be obtained not only for treating children of divorce. Informed consent becomes a very necessary procedure for all of the assessment endeavors related to child custody evaluations. Thus, for example, I'm familiar uh, with a case in the South, uh, where the psychologist uh, uses an informed consent procedure that details how, when, where uh, the psychologist's fees will be paid and how the psychologist's fees can increase if there are requests for services above and beyond the basic services, the psychologist called that procedure an informed consent procedure. It's not an informed consent procedure. 
an informed consent procedure clearly details who is providing the service. You don't, you don't refer to yourself as a therapist. Mental health professions in, 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 in legendary numbers call themselves therapists. What are you? Are you a massage therapist? Are you a physical therapist, occupational therapist? What is this? There's no such thing as anyone who is licensed as a therapist. So what are you licensed as? What are you going to do? And as a result of this procedure, will you be writing a report? Who will you submit that report to? Is it possible that you might testify at a legal proceeding related to my case? What is the nature of confidentiality between you and me in, 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 in the course of this procedure? And far too often, these altogether important questions go unanswered because mental health professionals do not carefully think through the issue of informed consent. And ethical mandate number five. Maintain familiarity with the relevant research, yes, and our surgeons wash their hands deliberately. Of course you should maintain familiarity with the relevant research. It goes without saying, why are we belaboring the obvious? And we know why the obvious is being belabored. There's not much beyond that that the profession recognizes. Now, the data is there. The work that Amy Baker is doing is available. The seminal work of Richard Gardner is available. And it's always interesting at this point in time, if you talk about Richard Gardner's work in detail and you just don't use his name, then the concepts will provoke typically open-minded acceptance. Then you use Richard's name and you got some more problems. A common pitfall when working with divorce and custody is making recommendations without having evaluated all of the relevant parties. Oh my God. The first professional presentation I ever made was in 1976 to the Michigan Psychological Association. At that time, I spoke about child custody evaluations and my emphasis was do not ever make a recommendation regarding parenting time in a subsequent to a custody evaluation unless you have seen all of the parental figures involved, including any step parents. In 1976, that was a very controversial position. I had people arguing with me in 1976. But what is shocking is that in 2009, a peer-reviewed article finds it necessary to advise, uh, avoid this problem, which is tantamount to telling surgeons, wash your hands very carefully. Now, custody evaluators need corrective feedback. And an appropriate way to do it is for the evaluator to write his or her report and then to invite the parents separately to meet with the evaluator to review the report and to ask each parent to identify errors and to see, are these errors of fact or are these errors of subjective interpretation? But this kind of a procedure makes a custody evaluation 
open and transparent. There are no secrets. We're not hiding anything from anybody. And it is very, very rare that child custody evaluators undertake this kind of open, transparent procedure. In ethical mandate number seven, carefully choose psychological tests. And again, we are belaboring the obvious. We must recognize the fact that there is no generally recognized and accepted standardized psychological test for directly assessing parental effectiveness. The test does not exist. Indeed, when we think about child custody evaluations, there is a subtle but unavoidable paradox that is involved. That is, with few exceptions, you are assessing the capacities of individuals to undertake responsibilities that they have not ever previously undertaken. That is specifically to say you are assessing the capacity, the capacities of individuals to undertake the responsibilities of functioning as a single parent. Yes, they've been a parent before, but they typically have not been a single parent. So psychologists need to think in terms of, I'm not just looking at concurrent validity. That is, how does this person function as a divorcing parent? I'm looking ahead and asking myself, how will this person function as a single parent? Now, let's apply all of these issues directly to alienation. And let's, first of all, consider Johnson's 2005 classic definition of an alienated child. It's a child who expresses freely and persistently unreasonable negative feelings and beliefs such as anger, hatred, rejection, and or fear toward a parent that are significantly disproportionate to the child's actual experience with that parent. Entrenched alienated children are marked by unambivalent, strident rejection of the parent with no apparent guilt or conflict. And now we switch to uh, John Stossel's description of, of alienation. And as we, as we switch to, to Stossel's description, we ask ourselves, when we encounter an alienated child, do we need to resort to our clinical judgment? Do we need to resort to any inferential process to identify an alienated child? Well, the answer is no. As we see with Stossel's experiences, the four-year-old boy is jumping up and down with joy. Daddy, daddy, daddy gets out of the car. Daddy's here. Mommy, look, daddy's here. But things aren't going to go well. Boy jumps up and down more saying, daddy, daddy. Dad yanks on the screen door handle, but still can't get it open. Dad looks at his little boy. He pauses, takes a deep breath, walks back to his car. The little boy doesn't understand. Why won't Daddy come? Why is Daddy walking away from him? The little boy disappears inside the house. Dad calls the police. And the police end up saying, our hands are tied. There's very, very little we can do. And a feeling of hopelessness begins to overwhelm dad. But maybe it's not alienation. 
Maybe it's domestic violence. Relying on our clinical judgment premised on our many, many years of clinical experience, if we look closely enough, and if we look hard enough, we can see a thinly disguised pattern of domestic violence if we look hard enough. Understanding, of course, that we always will see what we expect to see. So if we want to dismiss considerations of alienation and focus instead on domestic violence, the rule of thumb is infer, infer, and infer some more reject what is clear and evident. Now, for example, we can consider different psychological tests to identify children who are responding to domestic violence. In a 2009 issue of the Journal of Child Custody, Robert Geffner, self-appointed savior from California, advocates that we use tests, whoops, advocates that we use tests such as the thematic apperception test, Robert's apperception test, sentence completion test, draw a person test, kinetic family drawing, and the Rorschach. At this point, Dr. Lorandos is salivating. <laughs> he wants to cross-examine any mental health professional who's going to rely on these instruments to reach inferences about domestic violence because we have to recognize the practice of forensic psychology necessitates a higher standard than regular clinical practice. In regular clinical practice, if you're doing treatment work, you have many more opportunities for self-correction. You know, or as sessions go on, you can revise hypotheses, reject some hypotheses, accept other hypotheses, but in forensic work, typically, this is a one-shot deal. So if we look at those tests and then we look at Medoff's 2010 article in the Journal of Child Custody, those tests do not satisfy existing standards for testing in forensic matters. Those tests, such as the Rorschach, look at the ink blot and tell me what you see, or the thematic apperception test, look at this card and tell me a story. The story should have a beginning, a middle, and an ending, and tell me what people are thinking and feeling. And those kinds of procedures have been characterized as the Ouija boards of American psychology. They tell us virtually nothing. But they could be interpreted by someone with an agenda as being indicative of concealed family violence. Now, we do have saviors sometimes facing the music. Um, that is, if we look at the relevant peer-reviewed literature, uh, as reported by Meadoff, we know that tests such as the TAT, sentence completion test, draw a person, kinetic family drawings, and the other instruments that Geffner wants to use fall short of legal admissibility. In other words, they shouldn't even be admitted into evidence. 
But here, you've got to go back and think about what Dr. Lorando's talked about yesterday. We need attorneys to recognize what satisfies and what does not satisfy legal criteria for evidentiary admission. Now, in a 2007 article, Gould and his colleagues in the Journal of Child Custody talked about domestic violence and common sense, pointing out that behaviors can be abusive, but they don't amount to domestic violence. And confusing the two does not help clarify any, any family of divorce situation. If all mistreatment equals domestic violence, then the term domestic violence loses its meaning. And indeed, when people make allegations of domestic violence saying the children don't want to see their father or their mother because because of of the domestic violence that he or she created. And we need to begin to ask, is there any documented record of this alleged domestic violence? Were there ever any police reports? Were there any discussions of these issues with a therapist that would be recorded in notes? Were there any discussions of these issues with a child's teacher that would have been recorded? Or do the allegations of domestic violence suddenly appear here and now without any preceding history whatsoever? Indeed, it becomes necessary to discriminate between litigation-related conflict and domestic violence. Will litigation-related conflict increase as people divorce? Yes. Will they say horrible things to each other? Unfortunately, too often. Will they sometimes throw poorly aimed objects at each other? Yes, too often. Is this domestic violence? Not necessarily. When assessing allegations of domestic violence, we need to ask, how do those allegations impact on parental effectiveness? Sometimes there will be a, a relationship that, yes, there will be instances where domestic violence has occurred, and that history of domestic violence has undercut the parental effectiveness of one of the parents. But there can be other cases where the children are entirely unaware of any domestic violence, and the domestic violence that occurred is unrelated to the parental effectiveness of the individual involved. That is to say, if we stop and think, people do not exhibit the same behavioral characteristics as, as divorcing spouses that they exhibit as caring, concerned parents. Behavior can change enormously depending upon the role in which you find yourself. So where does all of this leave us? First of all, credentials per se do not confer competence on any mental health professional when dealing with children of divorce. We need to ask, 
what are the demonstrated abilities of this professional when working with families of divorce? The typical mental health professional, unfortunately, regularly conceals his or her work behind closed doors, therefore identifying actual competence is difficult. Lip service adherence to ethical mandates does not equal competence. Lip service to ethical mandates will not suffice for professional competence. Board certification is no guarantee of competence. It just reduces the likelihood of gross incompetence. Clinical judgment is never an adequate substitute, an adequate substitute for scientifically supported assessment and treatment practices. Alienation is typically self-evident when it exists. Too often, conclusions about domestic violence rest upon an inferential chain containing so many links that it's about to break under the burden of its own weight. And too often, those who rush to inferences about domestic violence do so while disregarding fundamental standards of practice. Now, what I've also been asked to do by Joe Goldberg is uh, people have been writing questions. And uh, I've got three questions which I think I can answer semi-competently. So I'm going to proceed ahead and do that now. First question is an exceedingly important question. Question is, are there any testing tools that are in the works to help therapists determine scientifically mild, moderate, severe stages of parental alienation? Now, whoever, whoever is asking this question is a well-informed person to begin with, a little background information. Testing tools, person's asking about the availability of standardized psychological testing uh, to determine scientifically to identify objectively the different stages of alienation. Unfortunately, not that I am aware of. Um, I have tinkered with an instrument getting data is difficult. There's other people whose names I'm not at liberty to disclose who are tinkering with their own instruments, but we're still very much at, uh, at the tinkering preliminary stage. So as much as this kind of an instrument is needed, it is not available. Next question. In your experience, can there be much progress in counseling therapy with 15-year-old daughter and mom while daughter remains living with father, severe alienator? He has to be, father has to be court ordered to take her to the counseling and is trying everything to get out of this. No. And I'm sorry, I know my response is less than encouraging. And what I am reacting to is how colossally naive family courts and judges and family law attorneys can be because this kind of a situation exists repeatedly where we're going to have therapy for the alienated child and the targeted parent, but we don't do anything with the alienating parent. The single most important issue in alienation is this, if you want to change it. You will have no profound change in alienation with a minor child until the alienating parent gives his or her permission to the child to have a visiting relationship with the targeted parent. 
until you get that outcome, not much is going to happen. Therefore, allowing the alienating parent to go scot-free in some treatment program is exceedingly naive and ill-informed. Thank you very much, Dr. Campbell. Um, please uh, join me in thanking Dr. Terrence Campbell.